who's coming to this meeting, whether you are based here in Puerto Rico, thank you for having us. And for everyone who has traveled in from far away, welcome to Puerto Rico. Uh, I want to give a special thanks to everyone who participated over the last day and a half uh, at the PR Grid conference. Uh, and many of the, those same people I see have come here and joined us today for this uh, CGI uh, special energy session. Uh, I'm going to hand it off to my colleague Wes here to get us into it, and we're going to have uh, both a panel as well as some table conversations. You'll have a chance to move around uh, at the tables, so for now, just go ahead and find whatever seat you can, and we'll get started. Thank you. Great. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Wes Adrianson. I'm with the Clinton Foundation. Um, as you know, the damage caused by Hurricanes Maria and Irma to energy systems across the Caribbean left millions of people without electricity, posing a severe threat to public health and causing setbacks to the region's long-sought economic security. Six weeks after Maria, only 30% of electricity had been restored in Puerto Rico. It took 11 months of power to, it took 11 months for power to be completely restored. Since then, high-impact projects by many of the people in this room, by grassroots efforts from local communities, governments, and the private sector have been undertaken to build back better with more sustainable and resilient energy systems. As the 2019 hurricane season approaches, there's renewed urgency to accelerate this work across the region. So just to give a little bit of context here, in response to uh, the hurricanes in um, uh, September of 2017, uh, the Clinton Foundation launched, launched this CGI Action Network uh, meeting on post-disaster recovery. Um, this is the uh, fourth meeting of the CGI Action Network and the first here in Puerto Rico. So we're very glad to be here. And again, thank you to everyone who has helped make this possible. Um, as you all know, the goal of the CGI Action Network is to drive uh, the creation of new, specific, and measurable projects. That is really what this is all about. Uh, we call these commitments to action and is why we bring all of you here to try to work towards making more commitments to action. Uh, these address key issues in terms of the hurricane recovery as well as long-term resiliency across the Caribbean. Uh, as a community aimed at driving action, CGI expects that everyone who is here as part of the Action Network will work towards making a commitment to action within one year of being a part of this engagement. Um, our role at CGI is to help you achieve this. Uh, so today and tomorrow, you, what you'll be hearing throughout the course of this Action Network meeting is 30 commitments to action uh, that have come to bear um, from past meetings that we will be uh, launching and announcing um, uh, over the course of the next two days. And a few of those will be highlighted uh, here today at the energy session. Um, so one example of this, uh, at one of the prior CGI Action Network meetings that we had back in August in Miami, we featured a commitment to action to install 250 kilowatts of solar power on the roof of the Rio Pedras market uh, here in uh, San Juan. This is a partnership with Mayor Cruz uh, and the municip municipal government. Uh, at the time, we played a video. Uh, we called for more partners to support this project. And we're happy that uh, since then, the commitment has raised uh, $1.1 million and the installation is underway. So we want to thank all of those partners who have contributed to make this possible. In addition to this energy session today, uh, we're encouraging those who are staying on uh, tonight and tomorrow to check out the other executive sessions around different thematic areas. Uh, this is really about trying to culture uh, cross-sectoral partnerships. So it's not only about energy, we are having this here, but we really want to make it um, you know, make it known that energy is, is integral to an entire system in, in, uh, when looking at resiliency. <clears throat> so I, I would, again, encourage those who are staying to look at some of the other sessions we'll be having. We do have one session tomorrow uh, that is also focused on the green economy, but we really want the people in this room who are focused on energy to be thinking about how does that apply to other uh, critical uh, fields and sectors. Okay, great. Um, so now I'm going to show you one of the projects that uh, we've been working on to quantify some of the great uh, impact that a lot of our partners have been having in Puerto Rico. Um, so this is the Puerto Rico Solar Map, and that's PuertoRicoSolarMap.org. Uh, the Clinton Global Initiative and Direct Relief have partnered on this initiative 
to demonstrate the progress of solar and storage projects at critical facilities in Puerto Rico. Um, this has really been a collaborative effort of a lot of organizations in this room today, so thanks to the folks who have shared data on their projects. Um, this tool allows users to, users to view the data about each project, including location, solar PV capacity, and installed battery capacity, um, and sponsor, sponsoring organization at quite a few sites. Um, so this is a screenshot of the map, which you can uh, view uh, online currently. Uh, we've got 146 projects, uh, a total PV capacity of 2.4 megawatts, um, and almost a million dollars of savings estimated per year. So that's quite a lot of impact. Um, so I think just a quick round of applause to all the organizations who've been doing this great work. Um, just to show you a little bit of the functionality here. Uh, so you can s filter by individual organizations. Here we've got uh, filtering by Empowered by Light. Um, and you can select an individual project. So here we're looking at a fire station um, just outside of San Juan. So take a look at that and do please consider sharing it on social media if you're interested. Um, so now diving into the special session, this is called Building Momentum and Achieving Scale for Clean and Resilient Energy in 2019. The goal of this session is to update each other on the progress that's been made, um, address major gaps and hurdles, and identify areas where all of us can come together to work to achieve a greater impact. Um, this is largely gonna focus on Puerto Rico in some ways, but undoubted, undoubtedly a lot of the knowledge can be applied across the region. And for those participants that are going to be joining us tomorrow, um, definitely encourage you all to join us at the Green Economies special session where we're going to be talking a bit more about the region holistically. So great, let's turn it over to the panel discussion. Great. So I'm going to introduce Roy Torbert from the Rocky Mountain Institute, who will be moderating our first panel. And panelists, please make your way to the stage. Seeing my panel come forward, that's great. I'll do a brief intro to myself, a little bit of context on how this panel fits into the upcoming table sessions, and then I'll give intros for each of my four distinguished panelists. So again, my name is Roy Torbert. I'm with the Rocky Mountain Institute. We are an independent nonprofit that for 37 years has been leading uh, the thinking on a transition to a clean and prosperous energy economy for all. Um, for us, that means work across electricity systems, mobility, the movement of both people and goods, uh, building efficiency, and industry, including carbon-intensive industries like aviation. So my, my particular work has focused here in the Caribbean, working with uh, many among our 15 island partners. That includes Puerto Rico, where we've been active since the hurricane, working primarily on three elements. One, advice into the evolving policy space with particular public collaborative in partnership, and you'll notice partnership is, is core to our ethos, in partnership with the Institute of a Competitive and Sustainable Economy. We held a public collaborative process last year in the summer that led to a set of recommendations into the forthcoming uh, Senate Bill 1121, which has now been passed by both the House and Senate and is in reconciliation. Secondly, we've also been working with Resilient Power Puerto Rico, and uh, again, they're, they're here today. Um, to, to advance microgrid funding and a set of toolkits that are now available online for uh, prioritizing different communities for community resilience efforts. And thirdly, we've been active with Save the Children and many other partners in uh, direct solar and storage projects for schools as places of refuge. So that's some of our work here in Puerto Rico. I'm really glad to host this panel and with all these folks who I'm really proud to sit next to. This is gonna serve as a quick introduction and laid some groundwork for the table discussions that'll happen shortly with a real focus on community level resilience. So I'll have questions for these folks and first I'll read off their bios. So we have uh, Secretary Laboy Rivera, who is the Secretary of the Department of Economic Development and the Executive Director of the Puerto Rico Industrial Development Company, PRIDCO. The mission to attract new investment, promote the creation of new jobs and strengthening small and medium enterprises. He is responsible for the formulation and strategic implementation of the Puerto Rico Economic Development Plan, including competitiveness related reform and infrastructure projects and the innovation of the technology agenda. We've also got Andrew McCullough. He's the Director of International Programs and Emergency Preparedness and Response at Direct Relief. Direct Relief works to provide essential medical resources to people in 80 countries around the world affected by poverty and other crises. Direct Relief is the only nonprofit in the country licensed to to provide prescription drugs in all 50 US states. Andrew was also the founder of a Sustainable Recycling Solutions, a social business that helped provide a solution to Haiti's waste and unemployment problem. Uh, thirdly, we have Angel Zayas, who uh, is the president of AZ Engineering. 
which specializes in electrical design for residential, commercial, and industrial applications with a specific emphasis on solar. He's also the distinguished former president of ACONER, which is the Asociación de Consultores y Contractadores de Energía Renovable de Puerto Rico. And lastly, and, and with the best story perhaps behind him in the last few days, is Alejandro Uriarte, who's too cool for school with his sunglasses, um, because as a moderator, my job is usually pretty boring, and I get these folks up here, I ask them some good questions. Over the weekend, Alejandro sends me some great photos of 17 stitches, a black eye that is quite impressive, and since then, I've been trying to come up with a good story of how he might have gotten this involving, you know, dramatic rescues of, of I, I, children. I fell down and hit some solar panels. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Committed to the cause is Alejandro. Uh, but he is the president of New Energy um, Consultants and Contractors, which is a local renewable energy company with 11 years of experience. Um, they've been very deeply involved in the recovery of Puerto Rico, working with the Clinton Foundation, uh, Solar Foundation, Direct Relief, Red Cross, AmeriCares, RMI, uh, Fundación Comunitaria, and others to install solar and storage systems in clinics and in public schools around PR. And thanks, Alejandro, for fighting your way through the pain to join us today. <laughs> so I'll sit down to join you and ask you a few questions as we move towards the table sessions. Is this working? There we go. So first, Secretary Leboy, I think in many of these discussions, including over the last couple of days, many, many want to hear first and foremost about how is the Puerto Rican government laying the stage for forthcoming work, particularly around community resilience, and uh, the CDBG is the acronym everyone wants to use. So can you give us a quick update, not only on what the, the government's doing, but how you see CDBG funds and the strategy program behind it fitting into community resilience? Certainly. Uh, first of all, thank you for this invitation and, and be part of this panel. Uh, and in front of this distinguished audience. Um, I think that uh, to better answer that question, it is important to put things in the right context. Um, I believe that by now you should understand that Puerto Rico is probably going through an unprecedented time in our history. This is truly unprecedented. When you look at all the factors that we have in front of us, we have, right now, billions of dollars earmarked for disaster recovery for the next 10 years. The numbers vary, but I think that you can be conservative to estimate that at least $80 billion to $100 billion will uh, get into the economy in the next 10 years. Out of that, $20 billion have been already earmarked and approved by Congress through the Community Development Block Grant disaster recovery, which is the CD, CDBGDR, $20 billion. And there's gonna be another 60 to $80 billion that will come in the, through the, um, what we call FEMA public assistance and, and hazard mitigation. When you look at that number, that's massive. Um, just to give you an idea, the size of our economy, our gross domestic product is $105 billion, 105. So the government of the U.S. is going to be spending, you know, just very simplistic explained, 10% roughly of our economy every year if those numbers get uh, materialized. Um, the ones that are already completely earmarked, like I said, is CDBGDR, which is about $20 billion, and that's still that's a lot of money uh, and probably unprecedented for HUD, you know, as far as we know. But that's not the only thing. You have to combine also other things that are happening in the island. Uh, if you heard of Opportunity Zones, which is you know the new thing in town, um, and the new buzzword, everybody it's in the U.S. is talking about this you know from the investment side, and there's about eight eighty seven hundred eight thousand seven hundred designated zones already by Treasury in the U.S. mainland, including territories. Puerto Rico is one of those. And it happens that we are the only jurisdiction that 94% of the jurisdiction is considered an ozone. So we're talking about almost the whole island is an opportunity zone. And then on top of that, Puerto Rico, even, even after the hurricane, we still have competitive advantages when it comes down to do business in Puerto Rico. We have you know, attractive incentives at the state side. Uh, we have a recognized uh, public-private partnership framework. And when you keep adding those, uh, certainly, very hard to dispute 
that Puerto Rico is a very unique jurisdiction within the U.S. when it comes down to transform infrastructure, to transform communities, and to transform the economy. I think that that's almost undisputed. Um, but I guess the question, and, and what we should focus is, what are we going to do with this unprecedented situation? And I think the key is really transformation. Um, <clears throat> what we expect to do with uh, $20 billion for CDBGDR, which is the first round of money that will come in, you know, in different phases. The first action plan was approved for $1.5 billion. And of that, for example, um, the majority of that was for housing projects, different programs associated with housing. And there's about $180 million that, are, uh, that were designated for economic development programs. This is very important because at the end of the day, anything that we do here for energy, let's keep the focus. We need to produce um, reasonable cost uh, electricity, reliable, resilient, but somebody has to purchase that electricity, right? So there has to be an economy. You need to have economic development in order to have people and businesses that will demand electricity. So I think if you ask me, that's one of the things that everybody should keep that focus. This is gonna be a means to an end. It has to serve a higher purpose. And the purpose is economic development in a sustainable matter based on a transformative perspective. Because certainly nobody wants to go back to what things were before the hurricane. Uh, Governor Rosselló has said it very well. You know, we have in front of us a blank canvas. This is the perfect time to transform. This is the perfect time to leverage cooperation and collaboration, to really look at best practices, to introduce technology, to introduce innovation. When we transform communities today, let's not think about today's needs. Let's think about what's going to be Puerto Rico in the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years. And I think that has to be part of the message when it comes down to how are we going to be able to uh, integrate communities as part of the solution and the overall energy design for the island and understanding that the communities today, what are going to be those needs in the future, and parallel to that, what is going to be the economy of Puerto Rico in the future. So one thing that we learn is that a lot of people that are now here in the island that wants to help uh, fellow U.S. citizens as part of a U.S. jurisdiction is that very little was known about the island. Very little. There's been an incredible uh, process of discovering what is Puerto Rico at the end of the day, and many of you that knew about Puerto Rico probably are rediscovering Puerto Rico. And just to throw out you know, a couple of points to your question, when we use CDBGDR along with the rest of the, of the funds, in this case for energy programs, and with the other, everything else that we, you know, that we have at, the, at our disposal to transform the system, think about uh, how can we connect that with what is our economic profile today and social profile today, and what is the economic profile and social profile that we want to have in the future. So for example, I can actually do an exercise today, and maybe some of you already cheated, and that's fine, but I would like, like to ask this question. What do you think is the contribution of tourism into our economy or GDP? Can someone can raise the question and give me a number? 7%. Do you believe her? What do you think? 7%? 45? Okay, you know that. That's good. But, the, well, that's, those are the numbers, so you cheated. That's fine. <laughs> now, I guess the exercise is that I heard she said 7%, and I asked, do you believe her? And somebody will say no. But that's true. Tourism is only 7% of our economy. And manufacturing is 48% of the economy. Okay? And the next sector is real estate insurance and, and, uh, and insurance is about 18%. Then you have services, and then you have tourism. Agriculture is 1%. Construction is 1%. Is that the economy profile that we want in the future? Of course, we want to change that. We want to still be a strong manufacturing sector in Puerto Rico, we want that, you know, especially the ones that are more uh, 
you know, connected to, to our assets and competitive advantages, right? But it doesn't mean that they, we need to diversify the economy, and we have to. So we need more tourism, and we need uh, more export services and export-oriented activities. We need to actually uh, push for more technology sectors, uh, agricultural sectors associated with industries and exports and so forth. But we need to understand these things when we think about what is going to be the design of Puerto Rico in terms of energy, generation and transmission and distribution, because we're not a typical island. We're not a typical island. And even when we get to the 20% that I think we should be at least in tourism, manufacturing and industry will still be a very important sector for the island. So those just an example of this you know, uh, rediscovery process, uh, the new awareness that I think we've been riding this wave, and, and we should continue doing so. Uh, and in terms of CDBDGDR, you know, there's a second action plan, just to connect to your question, um, about $8.7 million of that second action plan that now is being basically combined with the first. And we are in the process of receiving you know, basically the approval uh, from HUD for the combined action plan. And in that second plan, that's where you have $436 million that are going to be used for energy programs. Okay, And that, so far, the idea is that we'll follow something similar to what was done uh, a couple of years ago under the Obama administration uh, in terms of pushing for energy conservation, energy efficiency, and what is being known as a weatherization assistant, um, assistance program, mm -hmm. um, which basically tackles you know, at the community level and maybe at residential and small business level uh, the need to upgrade you know, systems that are more uh, energy efficient, and now with inclusion of solar panels and storage and maybe other forms of renewable energy that are fit you know, for this kind of program. Now, keep in mind, and this is going to be my, the end of my first part, keep in mind this, $436 million. That is on the demand side equation, right? You're going to have demand for solar equipment, for storage, and many other things associated with the program. That means that you're going to have residents and small businesses that are either going to depend less of the total grid, maybe, or even disconnect. And that's happening today, by the way. That is a trend that is happening today, and it's happening at the business level, at the commercial level, and it's happening at the industrial level, which, by the way, is the biggest client in terms of volume, uh, in terms of uh, electricity sold for the uh, state utility uh, company. We need to understand those things when we believe, when we design the overall design for Puerto Rico, whether it's going to be mini grids with micro grids, incorporating technology like smart grids, best practices like wheeling, and, and virtual power plants, all these things you know, that have to be part of the grand design. Understanding, again, the trend, because people are disconnecting, businesses are disconnecting, the industrial sector, all these big companies are disconnecting. Many of them already are disconnected from PREPA. And then on the other side of the equation, uh, what is going to be the economy of the future? What is going to be the, you know, our communities in the future? And what is going to be the technologies of the future? So today, solar and wind are the predominant you know, uh, technologies. And storage is, is there. But in the future, maybe five years from now, Puerto Rico is an ocean. Ocean technology should be part of the equation. Biofuels, hydrogen should be part of the, uh, of the equation and of the discussion. Great. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I think there's, there's elements there that are both unique to Puerto Rico and the, the strong manufacturing base here, but also communal to the, the, the entire region and many of the other islands that were so devastated by the hurricane season of, of a year and a half past, including USVI that is also eligible for CDBGDR. I think particularly this element of connecting all of those opportunities, which are so, so large and, and time bound to economic development as the core purpose is a very strong theme, I think, to take away from this. And increasingly, as you highlighted, the centrality of energy and energy services, not only disaster recovery, but the productive rebound of an economy that has been depressed, I think is essential to point out. So, so, Andrew, I might turn to you now. You know, you, you've worked across many jurisdictions, 
and you've seen, I think, changes, particularly on the technology side, seen, I think, in some projects, as we saw from the map from the Clinton team, uh, solar and storage increasingly take over, but you've also thought, I think, increasingly of what are the other community-focused solutions that we might need to consider against? So can you say a bit more about that? Sure. Um, I might give some background first, if I could, because um, <clears throat> I, I feel like I don't belong in this panel, maybe not even in this room, because a year and a half ago, like the expertise I had in solar was because I had it on my house and I drive an electric car. Um, and Direct Relief has been around for 70 years and has never been involved in energy. We, we provide medicine and medical supplies around the world. But after Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico and, and we were, we'd been working here and, and quickly we started giving small cash grants to the community health centers to keep buying diesel for their generators. And then that, the next month they needed it again and then they needed it again. And, about three or four months in, I think President Clinton came down and we had the opportunity to tour him uh, to a couple of the health centers and he said, you know, you guys should really consider doing solar on these sites. And he said, you know, that's a great idea, Mr. President. You should tell someone who does that. We don't, <laughs> we don't do that. And he said, well, you should. <laughs> and uh, it's hard to say no to uh, the president. And so then we moved forward because a, a a team was built, including um, Alejandro, experts in the field, um, other funders, private sector, and so we could get involved in the space and move forward confidently because the platform then was created for for us to um, feel that we, you know we were doing um, first what was asked for by the health centers. They were asking for this. Um, and then that we could work with the people, uh, the right people in the room to do it. Um, and so now, I think a year and a half later, we've nearly installed uh, a megawatt of solar and 1.5 megawatt hours of battery and I think represent about 40% of the projects in size of that map. And it's not even something we do. And so I guess the point of my story is <laughs> It's possible. There's very talented people in this country, um, in this island, part of this country, who um, know, you know, know how to do it. A year ago, there was a group in here, the room called Perlos Nuestros. They didn't even exist a year ago. Um, they're a local nonprofit here. They have now um, done eight nonprofit communities, 13 solar laundries, a school. They've done 330 um, kilowatts of solar, and, and they weren't even. They formed after Maria, so I think, yeah, thank you, that's a very good. <laughs> um, they're, and they're working with the communities. They're bringing the communities in the nonprofit areas involved. They're, they're having them build, build the, um, the rooms to hold the batteries. They're, you know, they're all involved. I just went to an, an inauguration last week and the plan is to do 100 of these. Um, and it's, it's working with a local group like them to get it done. And so I guess the point is it's doable and um, we're happy to just be a part of it. Um, and I think though, to your point, uh, um, there's, we get now thrown things all the time about um, what about containerized solution? What about biodigesters? What about wind? And w recently we got one with a solar panel with a wind turbine and another solar panel on top of it. Um, and I just send it to these guys to ask for what they think, but um, I think it's a great, uh, I don't know the answer, but uh, I think it's a great thing for us all to think about. Um, and we're happy to be here and in the room to be a part of it. Um, and I think it's an it's a example of what is actually great about the CGI model, is it brings groups like us who work in health together with groups in the energy sector, together with private companies, to actually get something done that individually might not have worked so well. And now we've been able to bring in others, as you've seen on the map, now 150 projects going on and, and growing all the time. So um, didn't answer your question, but I'll stop. That was great. Thanks, Andrew. And, and what I've really taken away from that, and also in, in the past year as well, is just the power of the network and the power of the partnerships that are needed between many who were here for, for decades prior and deeply knowledgeable in the energy sector, many who were part of the diaspora and came home because they felt the need to address such a, a pressing and urgent challenge. 
and the, the power of that network being able to say, well, we, I don't have the answer, but we, we can reach out to someone who can. And that's, that expertise is critical. So perhaps, Angel, I know, particularly with your past work with Aconair, you've got a great lens in how you know, a young engineer here in Puerto Rico can get more involved in the energy space and increase their skills and their training. Can you say a bit more about that and the opportunities you see coming forward? Yes, uh, first of all, Aconair is uh, an organization, nonprofit, uh, since 2007. We have around 250 members, more or less uh, uh, installers, distributors, manufacturers. So it's, it's, it's a combination of networking that we, we've been giving training since 2007 of the uh, laws and uh, technical aspect of, uh, of solar systems. And, and just as you mentioned, uh, we've been part of the uh, certification of uh, PV for installation. In Puerto Rico, for you to be able to do installation, you need to be certified by the agency, uh, government, by the program of energy efficient, uh, of energy uh, agency. And basically, uh, we've been providing those kind of courses to allow our installer to get up to date with the technology. For example, before Maria, Let's think about it, about this. 95% of all the installs in Puerto Rico were grid tight connected, PV only, okay? So Puerto Rico, after Maria, we just realized, hey, we need batteries. <laughs> Something that some were doing it, but not in the mass scale that we have had in the last year. So let's think about this. We've become one of the test laboratories for a lot of companies, and that's, that's what it is, okay? A lot of technology, different type of batteries. We knew about the lead acid batteries for, they've been in business since 100 years ago. Now we are with lithium ion and other technologies uh, that are available. And Puerto Rico has become one place for us, the existing community, the existing installers, to get up to date on that technology, put it in place in the right way, according to the electrical code, that is very important. So we can have long-lasting system uh, installed that could last for 15, 20 years. That's, that's really where we are heading through. So going back to your question, we've seen in the young engineers or electrician coming out of the technical college or even from the university with some kind of uh, solar and electrical courses so that they don't get into the business without at least knowing or touching that. There are a technical college that offer also the uh, certification for installation. And wh what I think is now that the need that we have, there's a lot of uh, opportunities, what uh, Mr. Lavoy has mentioned, we're talking about $436 million just on solar batteries for the next six years. So let's think about that. We require a lot of workforce, develop, train, to make the right things from the beginning. Not just putting some system, we have gone to different sites that really they have not gone to any of our training, to, just to let you know. It's really def deficient, and they have to need to be rebuilt because uh, or repaired because it's not showing the right uh, technical aspect to be to be installed. So I think the combination of uh, the universities, technical college, associations such as Conair and, and 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 others like CISA too is around, and there's a lot more. Uh, will really help the workforce to get us to the level and have installation that will last for the 15, 20 years. And that's, I think, something to, to think about it in, in, the, in the table for the benefit of Puerto Rico now and in the future. Great, thank you, Ana, that was great. Uh, Alejandro, I've really always been impressed by the, not only the, the personal commitment that we see quite visibly here, but your, your company and, and the projects, the breadth, really, across Puerto Rico, Vieques and Culebra, you know, all the way to the east and the mountainous regions. I think you've seen, particularly in the last year, but in your long history, the, the real variety in the sorts of energy projects that Puerto Ricans are increasingly demanding. 
So perhaps you could say a little bit about really what you've seen happening more in, in, in the, the low and moderate income space and how some of this movement that we've been describing in pieces and parts should be one that is broadly shared and not just exclusive to those who have the, the money or the, the networks to support it and, and really at the community level can be impactful. Yeah, I, I agree with that statement and, and it, it has been surprising for me to to go out, you know, get out of San Juan and, and go to the mountains and go to, to remote communities and, and really see the, the, the need uh, that these communities have for, for energy. Uh, just a, just a, a very quick story. Uh, a couple of months after the hurricane, I, I see in the front page of Primera Hora that there was a family in Maricao that did not have power since Hurricane George. In uh, that, that happened 20 years ago. And they never had power after that. Uh, I mean, they never had power from, from the grid. So, so we went there and we put a solar system, uh, uh, and you know, of course, these people were very happy. That led to that led other companies to go and give them a refrigerator, a, a washing machine, uh, and and something very surprising. After we installed the solar system, next time we went, these people already had like an extension cord from their solar system to to like three of their neighbors, and they were powering uh, neighbors and helping each other. So that, that that was very interesting for me. And the point of the story is that there's a lot of people uh, in the, you know, in these regions that 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 need help. Uh, and uh, you know, when when all these funds from the CDBG come come in comes in, uh, we need to figure out a way for for them to have to have access to these to these funds. And and this probably should be one of the top priorities that that that, that we have. Uh, and and a concern that I have with with these uh, communities is that. Yes, maybe CDBG can can cover part of the cost of giving them solar, but unless you give them the whole uh, equipment, uh, there's going to be some component that that somebody would, would need to finance or or help them with. Uh, so, I've, you know, I've always uh, been an advocate for creating some type of financing option using CDBG funds, creating some type of backstop or some type of uh, insurance, so that so that these communities can. Uh, can you know get CDBG funds, but then finance the rest of the project uh, in a way that that would be attractive, that the risk profile would be attractive so, to to some investors. But 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 definitely the the need is is out there, uh, and and we need to focus that uh, very very uh, you know urgently. Great, thanks, Alejandro. I'll have a couple questions for the group, and then I think we'll move to the next segment. And and. And the, the next question is really an anecdote of what, what you've seen with the energy space enabling community resilience. Alejandro, you just gave a great one, so maybe I'll start over here with, with Secretary LeBoy. Can you think of in the last year something that has really, an example you've experienced to say this is, this is how energy can enable community resilience? Well, I'm not sure whether the Marikao project is the same that I'm going to talk about, uh, but I, I think probably you know that Tesla made a project here. Is that the same or not? It's not the same, okay. So I think it was Las Piedras. Um, so yeah, we were part of uh, a community project with Tesla uh, and you know, last year. And I think it was basically the same kind of feeling. You know, um, Puerto Rico is, um, is 100 miles, about 35 miles. And Puerto Rico is certainly not only San Juan, as much as we love San Juan and the capital. And San Juan will always be the point of entrance and your first impression. And we want to you know, provide that best impression, no doubt about it. But Puerto Rico is beyond San Juan. You know, Puerto Rico is, is a beautiful island, you know, rich in culture, uh, and, and always said that the best asset that we have is, is our people. And when we talk about resiliency, it's really the resiliency of the people. That's what you know, got us so, you know, where we're today. It's really you know, that, uh, that story, is the resiliency of the people. Um, we partnered with Tesla, and they did a, a, a basically a community, you know, microgrid in Las Piedras, which is also uh, a town in the mountains in a, an isolated uh, community, and it was, you know, an, an unbelievable experience. But I'll tell you another story in terms of the resiliency of people. When we talk about our war, our workforce to be the number one or one of those reasons why we still have. Fortune 500 companies and, and other types of companies coming down to Puerto Rico and do business, and even local companies, you know, that are growing and expanding in the island. Uh, we talk about the, one of the reasons is because of the quality of the uh, reliability of our workforce. We always knew that, but after the hurricane, when we started, you know, knocking on doors of different companies uh, and understanding, you know, the state of business again, you know, 
once you go, uh, you pass the emergency phase, people need to go back to work. They, you know, you need work. People need their jobs. Uh, so we were very concerned about what was happening, right? Just to give you an idea, in Puerto Rico right now, there's about 42,000 private establishments in, in total. 42,000, according to SBA. So, <clears throat> yes, there were some small businesses that shut down after the hurricane. That number is still debatable. So we knock on doors, you know, big companies, medium-sized companies, small companies, uh, mom and pop, you know, shops, types of companies. Um, and when we were knocking on the doors of the big corporations, uh, you know, these multinationals, uh, Fortune 500 companies that are doing business here, we identify a common denominator. Top management, I'm not talking about in the island, I'm talking about top, top management, you know, CEOs, board of directors level. They were getting stories from the different plants and facilities that they have in the island that they just couldn't believe it. Two days later, two days after the hurricane, if you actually do a survey, the majority of the employees of these companies, they show up to work. Even when their homes were wrecked. Even when they didn't have anywhere to go probably. No power, no telecommunications, nothing. They didn't even, even know whether, you know, what was the state of their, of their relatives in other towns. They show up to work. And they ensure that their operations in one week or two weeks later after the aftermath uh, were started up, up and running, and start shipping medicines or shipping other goods that are manufactured here or even services that are critical for other companies or even outside Puerto Rico. And I know a lot of CEOs that nobody really knew that they were here in Puerto Rico in 12 months after the hurricane. Under the radar, you know, they just don't want the attention. And they came here and they greeted personally their employees here in Puerto Rico. And that's, that's powerful. That's very powerful. And all of a sudden, and I can tell you at least three cases that I know of, of facilities that for some reasons, you know, that we don't have to discuss here, they were kind of on the red line. You know, they were just thinking, you know, maybe it's not gonna, you know, there's no long-term future for Puerto Rico or that plant or the operation. And because of the commitment of the people, they say, wow, it's very hard to find this kind of commitment and also be competitive, you know, and, and the quality of, you know, of, of the workforce. But that level of passion and commitment is very hard to find. Plus, of course, their contingency plans and everything were tested in the most <laughs> crazy of the scenarios, right? I mean, contingency plans in Puerto Rico are now being used as benchmarks elsewhere, okay? So I, I, I think that's a powerful story when it comes down to community because <clears throat> you have a lot of manufacturing companies and other, sec you know, other types of, you know, of companies in other sectors that are spread out our, you know, across the island. You know, you have, you know, in the mountains, you know, in isolated areas, even in some coastal municipalities, and you, you saw that come, come on denominator. You know, people share your job. So for me, uh, when it comes down to promoting energy and the best practices of energy, solar, renewable, the pledge for climate change, you know, we are all for it, and the governor has been very clear that that's the mandate, and we support it 100%. But at the end of the day, let's never forget that what we need to do at the very bottom line is that we need to create jobs, and we need to create good jobs on a long-term basis. Right now, the labor force participation is 40%. It's the lowest of the of the 50 states and, and US territories. 40% labor participation rate. The average in the US is about 62. And you know what is the meaning of that? It means that right now we have about a million total jobs. And we have to protect those million jobs and create 500,000 jobs. And I'm sure that if we do this right together, what we do in terms of the energy side of the equation, promoting clean energy, sustainability, uh, and all these things that matter to us, and impacting communities, integrating them, let's keep that goal in mind. At the end of the day, we need to push for those jobs. And if we achieve that, and we do it in a sustainable manner, I think that we have done a great thing for the island. Thank you for that story and for that call to action.
Angel, would you add a, an experience from the last yes, year? Yes, uh, one experience that has two aspects. One is uh, community involvement. What we've seen, for example, in one of the Por Los Nuestros uh, projects, of a community water system. No water after the hurricane. They are really dealing with a generator, diesel, that cost, or you know about that. And seven, six months later, a solar system with batteries. But that's not the story. The story is that you need space. You need an extension of the, of the room. There's no space. So who gets involved? The community. That's they joint forces and they construct that extension of the uh, facility to have in-house the batteries and, and the system. Who works on the installation for the bases, the community? So there's a lot of involvement of the community and also us coming here and helping and working with different uh, installers in different areas across Puerto Rico we're talking about economic development too. We're talking about jobs. We're talking about people doing what is needed for the benefit of the community having water, for example, energy resiliency. And there are communities that they will working together just to have also an additional uh, resources of uh, energy, such as generator, just in case they need it when the batteries just, instead of charge, just drop. So there's a lot going on for, for us, and it's uh, very positive to see the community involved, uh, education to them on how to use the system. They get that, and what do you think people would like to do next during their houses? So I think this is massive, and with your help that you're putting into Puerto Rico, we're so grateful that you're doing all this because it's coming from the bottom, from, from the communities up. The government is doing something from top down. I believe we'll get Puerto Rico the best scenario for the next five to 10 years in energy. Thank you, Angel. It's, it's a shame we don't get more time with this great panel. Andrew, did you have a last experience to share? I'll be, sh I'll be quick. There's a health center down, uh, a community health center down in Arroyo, which is the southeast of the island where the Maria came through. Um, it was selected to uh, be a primary site for a solar and battery um, installation by the Primary Care Association. I'm looking at Javier who's here. We're doing the install with new energy, 225 kilowatt. It's a 475 kilowatt hour test the battery that's going in. Being on the rooftop and seeing those 400 or so panels, it's, it's a beautiful thing. Um, since that was done, another group came in, installed a satellite dish, a Viasat, Marty might be here, satellite dish on the roof. So now they have um, emerge, uh, communications, reliable communications with the energy. Now that with the energy in the time of a, a blackout, they can run about a third of the health center, including the emergency room and all these things. They have communication, reliable. Now they've put in a community hub where they're doing training sessions for the local community. They're actually doing a solar, uh, a solar lesson next week. Um, 800 students in the community who don't have access to internet at home can go there and use computers. They have a 3D printer they're teaching them how to use. With that, we're giving them a telemedicine um, device so they can get access to medical specialties because that needs reliable energy and, and internet to communicate. We've got them a backup a vaccine fridge that can now be powered um, constantly and a stockpile of medicines every hurricane season so that they have the medicines they need in time of a disaster. So it builds on each other, but it started with the energy. Um, Great. I want to add something qu quickly because I've, uh, we, we've, done, we've done schools uh, and so, some, some schools with, with RMI, uh, and, and it's, it's, it's very impressive when you see the power that the solar project has on, on every kid. Uh, I mean, it, it's so profound that I think we should focus on doing all schools in Puerto Rico. Because you install a solar system in a school, you're, you're helping the school be resilient and, and, to, and to make sure it's open after a hurricane so that it can attend all those kids. But, but you touch each of those kids that then they go home and they talk to their parents about solar. And it's like a chain reaction. And suddenly by installing a, a, a very small system in a school, you impacted a community of 500, 600 people. Uh, and you know, and, and we've seen the impact on, on that, and, and it's something that that I really enjoy, and, and it's something that, that we should do because 
it's, it's not only helping the school, you're helping, you're, you're bringing solar and the knowledge that solar exists to, to a whole community and to a whole of, you know, to a young generation and then we'll grow up to, 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 to know that solar is, is the way to go. So I, I really think that we should focus on, on doing as many schools as, as we can because that, that really would have a social impact that we cannot measure. Thanks, Alejandro. So some great elements here. Yeah. You know, from, from the catalytic power of, of solar energy in, in, among school children to you know, telecommunications and response to the sort of entrepreneurs in communities who say, what's the problem, let's solve it. And then I think to the, the big challenge of, of jobs and employment here in a, an economy that needs to recover. These are great elements that I think can help feed into our table discussions that are upcoming. I want to first ask for a great round of applause and then I'll hand it off to Jesse. I want to thank Roy and all of our excellent panelists for the conversation. Um, we'll work on the gender balance. Um, moving along, I mentioned earlier that uh, here at CGI we're all about facilitating commitments to action. We want to highlight now two CGI commitments um, in the energy space. Uh, again, these are new, specific, and measurable actions that partners who've been working um, with CGI have uh, been able to put together. And I'm going to hand it back to my colleague, Wes, to introduce these two uh, commitment to actions. Okay, great. So, yes, we've been developing tons of commitments to action. Um, I think at this meeting we're going to be announcing over 35 total, so that's fantastic. Thank you to all the organizations who've been doing that. We hope that you all can also commit to action uh, as part of CGI in the future. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce these fantastic commitment makers. Um, first of all... We've got a Footprint Project. Um, this is a great project. Um, uh, let me give you a little bit of background here. They committed to design and fund a containerized emergency command center for the Vieques Emergency Management Office to be powered by solar and storage and located at the primary community emergency shelter for the island. So I'll bring up Will um, to the stage, and if you could give some applause. Um, yeah, and if you could just share a couple of minutes about the project. Um, then I'll give you one of these uh, certificates. I like a certificate. <laughs> Thanks. Um, thank you all. I just want to say first, um, this is a very small project, and it's a drop in the bucket compared to a lot of the other larger commitments that have been made. So first of all, thanks for everyone who has made larger commitments and who can make larger commitments. I think that's how we solve this bigger problem. Um, also, thanks to our partners, Clean Energy Group and Blue Haven Initiative for the funding. Um, Simplify Solar Foundation for the equipment, and uh, Solar uh, University of Puerto Rico's Inesi, University of Minnesota, Hive Cube, Box Power, and Sail Relief for all the in-kind support. I mean, it's truly a group effort, and we couldn't have done it alone. Um, I just want to share one quick story about Vieques that I think illustrates the gap between emergency response and deployed power with long-term recovery issues. So six months ago, I was at the Clinton Global Initiative meeting, and we were trying to fundraise for, to buy the Tesla system that had been deployed on the CDT in Vieques after the storm. They had done it, it was great, they were powering the system, and now they needed to offload that large 250 kilowatt-ish array and a 700 kilowatt hour battery bank, because they need to find a buyer, they can't just give stuff away, unfortunately. Um, we failed at finding the money, um, and we, we, I say this because in November, Tesla had to pull the system. So they packed it up off of the CDT and moved it to a warehouse somewhere in Guaynabo. So it's in storage, um, and while we're sorting out the larger plan for Vieques and the community grid there, we lost the opportunity to transition a deployed asset into a community microgrid um, and transition that ownership into community hands. So I just want to illustrate that problem because I think that if we can find the larger networks of people that can you, you know, get the companies their good press, get the systems in, power the refrigerators, get the deployments done, and then leave them, um, and if we can figure that out, we'll do a lot of good after the next storm. So thank you. 
The warehouse. Trust the warehouse in Guaynabo. Okay, so Tesla has a couple other systems on Vieques. They're trying to offload them, and so we'd love to transition them over to Community Hands. What happened to the one that you were talking about? It's packed up, and it's waiting some warehouse in, I don't know. It's somewhere on mainland Puerto Rico. Nobody bought it? It's used. So it's a used asset. No, I know, but yeah. they, they, Tesla, I think they haven't found a buyer. They're here. Yeah, they're here. Okay, great. Thank you very Let's much. talk more about that oh, offline. <laughs> Oh, yes. <laughs> there we go. That's all. <laughs> Thank you. There we go. <laughs> Both of our first time doing that. So, <laughs> um, so our next commitment to action is going to be um, a really amazing project uh, by the Community Foundation of the Virgin Islands. Um, this is um, uh, going to be a solar install by CFVI, partnering with the Lutheran Social Services of the Virgin Islands. Um, and others to increase the solar energy capacity and energy efficiency at the campus of the Queen Louise Home for Children on St. Croix in the USVI. Um, so I'd like to bring up um, Dee and Junia, if, if y'all are here. Great. Yeah, so we've, we've been supporting you all in this project, and I think they also have um, a funding gap, as many of us do. <laughs> so those of you who are generous in the room, I hope you can introduce yourselves uh, to Dee and Junia a little bit later. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Why don't we start with the photo? Oh, okay. Sure. Okay. okay. <laughs> the photo. We'll start with the photo. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> there you go. Can do the I'll photo. Okay. <laughs> okay. <Great>. Sorry. <laughs> we didn't practice. <laughs> For uh, the Community Foundation of the Virgin Islands, this was an opportunity to partner in a new way with an organization that we have partnered with for years in the U.S. Virgin Islands. And it was really in large part due to the Clinton Global Initiative bringing us together um, to think about different things because CFBI focuses on children, youth, and families in many of our projects. And Lutheran Social Services is one of the most important providers of services to children and families in the territory. So we've worked with them on programs and um, early childhood and summer enrichment. But this was something where they are very creative and um, committed executive director was able to think a different way in how she wanted to use the storm to build forward. So she'll tell you. And it's a small project. Um, the cost is at 300000 of which Community Foundation have, um, has committed 100000 So we're hoping that we have 200000 in this room. <laughs> it's, um, often, it's not an orphanage. It started out as an orphanage 114 years ago. So we've been loving and caring for children for 114 years. So we have two cottages for children who've been abused, abandoned, or neglected, where we provide total care um, as best as we can, like such a, as you would for your own children at home. So um, they do all sorts of activities. We encourage them to venture out and, and encourage whatever interests them. We even have them do touristy thing where they go shopping for the day, they go for dinners and so um and and so the kids are hopefully experiencing what they would um or what your children are experiencing for the most part. And on that campus we also have a cottage for for children who are severely disabled. And again we provide them with love, care, I would love them dearly and you would too if you if you saw them. And then the last um, project on that campus is um, an early Head Start program, our first early Head Start program. We have two in the Virgin Islands and um, both owned by us. And so the first one originated where we turned what was the um, nursery where we housed children birth to three for many years. And if you could imagine an orphanage where you had um, 
cribs lining the walls. That's what we had. And now it's an early Head Start program that serves 48 families and best program ever. And so our hope is that we can get the support to solar up Queen Louise home. Whenever there is any kind of power outage like we had like two and a half months after the storm, you know, we gotta find ways to get water to the kids. So you have all these little children running around. We, did, we do have a generator, but they're not designed to run for two and a half, three months. Um, and there's the only, that's the only way we get water to them. So you have little feet and little fingers, little hands, and no water, not fun. So I hope that God is pulling at your heartstring to, to kind of help us support, um, find the support for that project. So I want to thank Community Foundation D. Thank you, and Wes, Adrian, and the others from the um, community, the Clinton Foundation, who really worked hard to bring this project here today. So, thank you. Well, <clears throat> we, we are going to move in a few minutes uh, to a more interactive um, table conversation. But before we do, uh, we do have two more quick, um, brief presentations. I do want to ask Tom Feigl from Grid Alternatives to start. Uh, there you are, Tom. Start coming, head on up this way. And I just wanted to mention again, you know, these are two of the commitment to actions that are that we're highlighting here. Uh, throughout the next day and a half, if you're staying with us, we have a couple dozen more that have come about. And if you have interest in uh, working on a commitment to action and getting the, the uh, support of our team to help facilitate that, please come find me or come find my colleague uh, Wes and we can talk you through what that looks like. Tom, let me pass it over to you. Tom's from Grid Alternatives and is going to talk to us uh, a bit about what they're doing um, in terms of workforce development. We have uh, slides queued here. There we go. Great. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Tom Fiegel with Grid Alternatives. Um, it's just such a pleasure to be here in Puerto Rico, uh, especially coming from Colorado, where a polar vortex is essentially settling in on our state. So uh, wonderful to be swimming in the Caribbean this morning. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about Grid Alternatives' uh, work. Um, and uh, give you a, a few examples of some of our projects. Uh, Grid Alternatives is the largest nonprofit solar installer in the country, in the United States. Um, we work to make uh, solar um, accessible to underserved communities, and I'll get in a little bit more into our mission. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the policy side of what we do, um, the, the term low-income solar policy and kind of equitable renewable energy policies. Uh, talk a little bit about some of our workforce initiatives and leave with a few thoughts for, for discussion. Um, so again, Grid Alternatives, we are the largest uh, nonprofit solar installer in the U.S. Uh, our mission is to make renewable energy technology and job training workforce development available to underserved communities. Uh, also on kind of the policy side, we advocate for equitable and accessible uh, uh, renewable energy policies and programs. Uh, across the country. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, we're installing solar that benefits low-income communities, uh, affordable housing projects, uh, disadvantaged communities, um, both on-site solar and what's called uh, community or off-site solar as well, um, as well as we have a national tribal program that works with Native American tribes across the U.S. Uh, and a, a small international program that's based out of Nicaragua. Um, just to, to kind of snap through a couple of uh, some of our, our projects in action, uh, single-family solar projects bene benefiting homeowners, and we're really doing these projects mostly as a, uh, a program to reduce energy burden and comp complementing things like energy efficiency services uh, uh, to, to create impact and, and savings for, uh, for families. Um, Multi-family solar, uh, uh, we provide a national technical assistance program for uh, federally assisted housing to figure out all the ins and outs of, of installing and financing solar. Uh, again, driving cost savings for affordable housing uh, owners and operators. Uh, community solar, this is actually my primary focus as well, if anybody wants to get into the weeds on community solar, but basically it is a, uh, a virtual model whereby you have a 
a solar project that um, is not on your roof, but it's shared by a number of community members through virtual net metering or another policy that enables this kind of program. There's 20 states in the U U.S. with these programs, about half of which have significant sort of low-income or equity-focused carve-outs, um, and it, it's, a, it's quite a growing model in the U.S. Uh, oops, I, well, oh well. Um, well, brief, uh, so our tribal program I mentioned uh, is focused around workforce development with, uh, again, Native American tribes, as well as uh, uh, solar installations uh, on tribal lands. Um, and again, I mentioned we have a, a small international program that's headquartered out of uh, Nicaragua, which provides um, uh, solar installations and workforce training uh, for uh, kind of critical services in Nicaragua, Nepal, and Mexico currently. Um, a, a few quick shots of some of our international projects. Um, it, to, to date, in total, we've it's installed almost 50 megawatts of systems. Uh, uh, the net metering credits or the, or the direct savings from those projects have generated about $340 million in savings for, uh, for our clients. Um, we have tr uh, provided training opportunities for 40,000 individuals and had 1,500 reported job placements uh, in the solar industry um, and uh, offset uh, 850,000 greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we, we get a question a lot on how we kind of finance this model. Um, there's is really a, a combination of sources. Uh, a federal, state, and lo local incentives. I'll get a little bit more into the policy side of what we do um, in a moment. Uh, carbon pricing and greenhouse gas auction revenues is actually a, a pretty significant source of, of funding our model. Uh, uh, solar industry finance projects, um, and then we're also, as a nonprofit, uh, uh, we partner with uh, corporations, uh, philanthropies, uh, uh, foundations. We leverage uh, CDBG grants in the U.S. Uh, for our projects um, and uh, uh, many other uh, kind of strategies. Um, Quickly, just to, to dive into uh, kind of an overview of, of um, uh, equitable solar and renewable energy policy in the U.S. Uh, there are a number of states that are creating these sort of policies and programs. I know this is a very hard slide to digest, but um, uh, projects at the state or programs at the state level that range from uh, uh, rooftop community solar multifamily uh, programs that are aimed at low-income customers and affordable housing providers. Um, there are a number of storage state-level programs now that have kind of low-income components to them to increase uh, uh, low-income and underserved community adoption of those technologies. Uh, community solar, as I mentioned, um, is growing very quickly. And states are doing these projects for a number of different reasons. Uh, but economic, injusti economic justice and access is one of them. Um, certainly, you know, when a state is making a large ratepayer-funded investment in a new technology, uh, as many have in the past, um, low-income ratepayers are part of that, and including an equity component uh, is something that, that many states view as an important uh, uh, goal as part of that. Energy burden reduction and bill savings. This is really kind of a growing area now that solar has come down in cost so much. Solar is an allowable measure, for example, through the, state, uh, the federal energy efficiency programs, uh, uh, weatherization assistance programs, uh, and many states are using solar essentially in, in tandem with those programs to provide electric energy burden reduction. Um, economic, op economic opportunity and workforce development and uh, uh, climate and environmental justice. Um, just a, a quick snapshot, California is really kind of the the leading state in many of these areas. Um, Grid Alternatives head, is headquartered there in Oakland, uh, and we operate uh, in program administration, implementation, as well as advocacy. I'll just highlight quickly two kind of key policies, um, with one with the original California Solar Initiative. This is a $2.5 billion ratepayer-funded solar uh, a program to increase especially distributed solar adoption in California. 10% of that funding was carved out for low-income customer adoption. Uh, th that initial investment has served over 20, 000, or, or 19,000 low-income customers to date, and numerous programs have kind of expanded some of those initial uh, uh, low-income-focused solar adoption programs. 
uh, cap and trade as well is, is another major policy that drives investment towards uh, solar and distributed energy adoption for underserved communities in California. 25% uh, of those revenues in California are required to go towards disadvantaged communities, and that's funding everything from uh, solar adoption, energy storage, there's a new EV access, uh, electric vehicle access program that started in the state, um, and uh, uh, many other kind of initiatives expanding on some of the original work in, in California. Um, if you're interested in, in uh, more of these policies, we track kind of the, the, the progress and, and uh, uh, provide a database in partnership with Vote Solar, a solar advocacy group in, in uh, the United States that tracks the development of these types of, of policies. And uh, Grid Alternatives is also um, uh, kind of the, the other half of our mission is around solar workforce development. We use all of our solar projects as a way to provide workforce training opportunities. We have a number of diversity initi initiatives within our organization um, to increase women in solar. Uh, we have a reentry program for prison populations reentering the, the industry. Um, high school partnerships and training programs, a, a veterans to solar initiative. And then probably the biggest part of what we do is, is called our Solar Core program. And that's funded through uh, essentially AmeriCorps to provide a year of uh, solar service essentially for about 200 uh, of our staff per year. Um, and I'll, I'll just uh, wrap it up with a few considerations. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Grid Alternatives uh, uh, it pushes for equity, inclusion, and diversity to be kind of a foundational principle of all renewable energy um, or, or all energy policy, really. Uh, so, you know, there are a number of ways that that can be a foundational principle. Um, some states have included executive orders or equity advisory committees to really drive that, uh, that principle within their policy development. Um, f uh, funding sources, you know, certainly the CDBG sources were mentioned. Uh, uh, greenhouse gas pricing, if that's any sort of future policy uh, within Puerto Rico, could be a potential source of funding. I also mentioned the state or, or the federal weatherization programs that do allow uh, funds to go towards solar adoption. Um, and community solar is also just kind of a dynamic model that uh, allows for a lot of different uh, uh, financing mechanisms, um, PR, uh, public related investments. Uh, 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 many of the programs have uh, kind of inclusion targets for low income, and it, it really is driving most of the, the kind of low income participation in solar in the US uh, uh, currently. Um, and then just encouraging co-benefits, especially workforce development, requiring training or uh, encouraging training within installation, and making sure that the policy goes hand in hand with driving uh, a distributed job creation. You know, distributed solar especially can really encourage that long-term um, career pathways and opportunities that, uh, you know, certainly the United States has benefited from. Um, and uh, I will leave it at that. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity to... Uh, to be here with you all and, and uh, appreciate uh, CGI again for holding this, uh, uh, this meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Tom, thank you very much. Uh, and I, I want to ask uh, Wadi Gonzalez and Katia Sanchez Rios to come on up as well from uh, FEMA to give a, a brief update to us. Thank you, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I have a very short time. When I wrote this, I, it was probably an hour, so I'm going to condense it. So I will speak quite fast. So pardon me for maybe using the less words that I need to use, but I would like to at least go through most of the process. One thing that is really important in Puerto Rico for those who are working in here and those who are coming to work in Puerto Rico in the recovery process is to understand how social services and our health and the health uh, uh, providers in the island. In 1996, the governor of Puerto Rico, who this place is honored by, uh, Pedro Rosello, um, was uh, was the, the, uh, changed the process of the way we do uh, uh, healthcare in Puerto Rico. He began the process of privatization. And what had happened through the years that he has been, that there was work out from that uh, governor to the 
the uh, subsequent governors, is that we have a mixed system. We have a system that has private sector, nonprofit sector, and governmental. And one of the most important uh, facilities that you will probably be in contact, and by the way, was mentioned here several times, is the diagnostic centers, CDTs, as we call it in Spanish, and those are a combine of, uh, of different owners, and that's one of the things we also want to include. Uh, the other part of the process of providing assistance is what we call in Puerto Rico the 330, which are basically our federal qualified uh, health facilities. And those facilities are, um, are nonprofit, and they usually target the population, the, the uh, low, low income, uh, low uh, serve populations. Uh, there are other facilities in the island that uh, we also work with, and those are facilities for uh, trans uh, transmitted sexual diseases, uh, trans uh, transitional services, as well as pediatric centers. All these are most of them governmental uh, facilities, and we'll talk about what is governmental and what is not governmental. Uh, hospitals, it's really interesting to, uh, uh, to understand, a lot of you have heard about working on Vieques, and I've heard there's a hospital in Vieques, but actually it's a CDT. The issue is that it has a hospital license, and a hospital license means that you will be able to open it overnight and be able to have patients in there. But technically, and as well as in the terms of us, and uh, working with the, uh, with the, um, uh, working with the government, uh, municipal government, the facility is, uh, is, is technically just a treatment center. And we actually have a functional treatment center that we have reestablished uh, in the island, and we're working on the permanent construction on the uh, next one. So as you probably know, most hospitals in Puerto Rico are located in the urban centers, and uh, it is also important to know that there's really 67, the 68 is, is Vieques. Out of those, there are different ownership. Why so important ownership? Because when you are looking for projects to work with, you need to know who's, who's the actual agency or, 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 or uh, organization that really has uh, an important role in managing and receiving the resources. So they're municipal, they're, uh, they're also a combination of municipal and um, for-profit organizations. The government uh, of Puerto Rico took the, uh, the, uh, the uh, facilities and provided it to the, uh, the hospitals and provided it to the municipalities, the municipalities turned around and contracted a, uh, a for-profit provider who's now running the facility. So if you are donating or working on donations for one of those hospitals, you need to know who's responsible for the building as well, who's responsible for the content and, and the services. So we have uh, private for profit, private not for profit, uh, state agencies, uh, state government. And also one of the things we have been working on is to determine other hazards. When you're looking at projects and trying to work with other organizations, you need to look what other hazards are in Puerto Rico? In fact, we are vulnerable to earthquakes and tsunamis. So they are hospitals, they are schools, there are many, many facilities that are in uh, flood zone areas as well are in tsunami areas. And the uh, CDTs, there's 102 of them, 50 of them are private for-profit. So they are really are non-governmental agencies as we said, when we are privatizing the, the services in the island, the government sold some of the facilities and, and they provided the licenses to these other providers to be able to provide services to uh, the communities. Uh, there's 12 private nonprofits, there's 16 non uh, governmental, state governmental, and 24 municipal, but still managed by the municipalities. And again, look at it, four are in the flood zone, and one is also in tsunami area. Severely damaged. So we identified 23 of those of the 91 facilities that were uh, suffer uh, severe damage. Some of them were basically uh, destroyed. There's one in Maunawa. I don't know if you know where Maunawa is. That one it has to be rebuilt. It's one of the projects we have uh, for repairs and rebuild. Um, so there's also important when you look at the map of the island, the majority of the resources are on the coast. When you go to the mountain, to the center, you find yourself with limited resources in the mountain, limited facilities that provide healthcare. All right, pressing the wrong button, there you go. So the uh, F FQHCs are 
basically all over the island, but because they're not really primary facilities, they don't have overnight facilities, they can't really not provide the level of the help and assistance that can be provided by CTs and hospitals. That is also important. Uh, one of the things is that a lot of agencies that we have worked on, we, we are working on, have a uh, relationship with the, F, with the FQ, uh, FQHC facilities, and they're being able to provide assistance to them, and a lot of them are being re repaired and rebuilt. We have one in San Lorenzo that is going to be completely rebuilt uh, from scratch. So if this map, I'm putting it in there just because I really want to show you how all these facilities were built in areas of high danger. So there's, there's flood zones, there's areas that, that are liquefaction, and areas that can be severely affected by other hazards, and that should be considered when looking at uh, provision of assistance to health facilities. Uh, that's another example in the south uh, of how the facilities are really on flood zone. In Jalcoa, as you know, is where the hurricane came in, and therefore it's one of the, the uh, most severe affected areas in the island, and even the CDTs and others are also in, in in harm's way. That's the west coast, and that's the Mount Nau area. Humacao also was severely affected. So let's talk for a second about elderly facilities. So um, Puerto Rico has 70% uh, of all social services in the island are provided through uh, nonprofit organizations. And uh, many of these facilities that are for the care of the elderly are really multi-facilities. They're not necessarily the way you know it in, in CONUS, they really are more about elder care than what they are about nursing homes. That is really important because the majority of the services provided are provided for um, for-profit organizations. They do, they, their uh, person has a house of six rooms or so, and you know nobody living with them, and then decided to use it as, a, as an elder care facility, register with the Department of the Family who regulates them, and then becomes then an elder care facility. They have to meet certain criteria, including things like generators and storage of water and supplies, but when it comes to disasters of the size of Maria, they were not able to provide the services and assistance that was needed for the, for the elderly. There is uh, multi-agency licensing, Department of the Housing and Department of the Family as well as Department of Health has to re regulate most of them. So when you look at elder care licenses in 20, 2019, there's approximately 1,189 facilities that are licensed to provide elder care. And there's where people, elderly, of different, different types of situation conditions, there are several different kind of facilities are where the majority of the elderly are in the island. Interesting, the, what is called independent, what we know as independent living facilities are regulated by a separate organization, which is the Department of Housing. Department of Housing is the one that basically has what we call in Puerto Rico, ejidas. So if you hear about ejidas, those are what are equivalent in the states to independent living facilities. The huge ejidas in the island, meaning of hundreds of, 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 of different uh, people in those uh, facilities. Some of them are nearby, the uh, maestros, policias, and other um, trade uh, uh, develop their own ejidas for the, for the right re the retirees, and this is where one of the systems that we have in the island. Difference from the, the elder care facilities, these facilities, people have to be ambulant, they have to be taking care of themselves, but they also are in high-rise facilities. And this is one of the things I really wanted to focus on. In Puerto Rico, we don't use methane, we use propane. There's a difference between methane and propane is you cannot pump it up. So as you are live in the States many years, and I live in high-rises, and I have gas in my, in my apartment in seven, eight floors. But here, propane can only go to the first floor, therefore, they have to use electricity. So every one of those facilities over there that I mentioned over here don't have a mean for uh, cooking, refrigeration, anything beyond when the electricity goes out. And as you know, generators in the majority of these facilities only cover uh, basic functions of the building, elevators, staircases and emergency, and emergency lighting. And this is just not gonna go through those. Those are the different types of facilities under the different authorities and how they're funded. Uh, what are we doing? What is FEMA doing? So we were talking about the way we were working in the public assistance program. We divided ourselves into 12 sectors as the way we're doing recovery in Puerto Rico. And those 12 sectors 
I'm the lead for the health and social services sector, which is the largest one. And uh, we have all the sectors that deals with the elderly and deals with, uh, with facilities of healthcare. And those are the education, municipalities, and public building sectors. Together, we believe that we will be spending approximately $2.5 billion in, in, for activities in terms of repairs, reconstructions. We do have several buildings we will be rebuilding, but the majority of the facilities in the island are made of cement. One great thing about uh, the wind and cement is that cement wins the battle be, be against the wind, and so therefore the facilities are there. What it does, do, what it does, what it does, what we have known for since the beginning of the process is that the roofs are severely damaged. One of the things that I mentioned here, but I really want to mention to, to you is that in Puerto Rico, they have a tendency to put uh, uh, a lot of stuff on the roof, a lot of stuff. That includes uh, 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 air conditioners, um, ducts that somehow didn't make it into the building, so they make it through the outside. So what, what does that do? What it means that when you have winds and debris coming to those buildings, you have damaged roofs. And before we go into projects of providing solar power to a lot of these facilities, we need to ensure that the roofs are basically repaired correctly, as well as protected uh, from the next uh, disaster. We need to mitigate the process. So we have, of the, of the 67 hospitals, we have 29 that are part of our, of our portfolio. Uh, some of them do have uh, uh, had or had had uh, solar panels. A lot of those solar panels will strip away by the storm, damaging the roof and therefore increasing the, the, the cost of repairs. Uh, all of the facilities have one generator. By, by law, they should have two, three sources of, elect of electricity. One generator, one grid, and in, because in Puerto Rico, the grid is only one single line, you have to have then two generators. And that has become one of the big deals that we have to work on in mitigation and so on. It's what is the second alternative source of, ele of energy for those facilities. Uh, we have 40 CDTs of the, of the 92 that we mentioned. Uh, some of them lack generators from the beginning of the process, which is basically not legal. They were not, they were not complying with the regulations at that time. And that's one of the things we had to work on with, uh, with the owners of the facility. 20 of the federal qualified health centers are uh, working, and approximately 80 of the elderly and social services organizations, some of them are still pending for assistance, so we're still working on them. Um, a lot of them have no resiliency. There's no mechanism for them to be resilient, to have the capability to restore beyond just how they were before, and no backup generator. Uh, some, some of the facilities, uh, we have something called critical facilities uh, determination. FEMA, when you, have, when you have a critical facility, that means that we are able to do more in terms of assistance to those facilities, and we are, do, can do direct grant funding to them. Uh, and everything has to be revealed to code, and as you know, the code was changed. The 2018 code is now the, the uh, International Building Code is a new code in Puerto Rico for 2018, and none of the LA facilities are considered critical. So the vulnerable population, the one we have to work really hard to, to help, we still cannot do uh, a lot for it. We just can do what they were before. We cannot do improvements or the facilities, except for the program that Katia is gonna to talk to you, if I can get the clip right, <laughs> in a minute. So within FEMA, we have a program that it's called hazard mitigation, and hazard mitigation is basically uh, reduce and eliminate future hazards from natural disasters. So one of our accomplishments is to try to meet the current uh, building codes, and above that include hazard mitigation measures, and to strengthen the critical healthcare facilities within the island to try to uh, ensure the availability before, during, and, and after a disaster happens. So one of the challenges that we have identified within the health and social services sector is that we have several infrastructure issues. Uh, because of the location, just as Wadi mentioned, we have certain that are in the tsunami and the flood zones. We have ones that are in remote areas that are in the mountains. We have lack of power because of the conditions that happen after the event. 
we have several accessibility and transportation issues try to access the hospitals and the CDTs and all the healthcare facilities. We have water supply shortage that caused some hygiene and problems that were affected through the to the system. We have communication issues. People cannot we're, we're not able to communicate within each healthcare facility. We're not able to understand and get access to the services. So under the governor's recovery plan, we are one of the uh, proposals is that increase the use of solar panels to try to improve the solar system and to improve the power, the lack of power that we had after the event. We want to ha improve the capacity within the, the system. We ha want to establish and reinforce uh, best practices of electricity electricity grid. We want to increase the access to tel telepaths and options for the community. And some of the possible hazard mitigation projects that we have been working on is to propose innovative alternate power solutions to ensure the backup power is available. We were thinking of microgrid maybe using solar panels or combined heat and power systems. We want to reduce wind and flood and seismic risk of critical infrastructure. Just as mentioned, Wadi, we are really vulnerable on our roofs, on our windows, on our envelope, on the facility envelope. So we, we want to strengthen all those elements within the facility. We want to develop a communication network to provide accurate and appropriate accessibility information through the healthcare providers. We want to provide water supply and, and system for the healthcare facility to ensure the continuity of the operation. We want to everyone to be more resilient and have accessibility to all the resources available. So those are some of the projects that we have been working on. So if anyone have a questions, so. And just, just to add, uh, the, the funding for the uh, hazard mitigation 404 for those who are who you know the program is $4 billion, for approximately $4 billion for the island. And uh, the number of projects that we're finding that will probably will be funded will be an incredible, we may not even be able to meet all the requirements and the needs of the island with that funding. Thank you. Thank you.